Thank you very much. It's again a wonderful opportunity and a pleasure for me uh, to be part of the ULP Authors Forum. It really excites me, this program, because it's a program that is aimed at helping all of us, the continent in particular, to write our own stories. Uh, confidence always repeats this, that uh, if the lions don't write their own stories, uh, the stories that will be written are those uh, that celebrate the hunters. And we know the history of our continent. It's been written by some people from other parts of the world. And uh, we need to change that narrative. We need to change that story. And that's part of this program. And I'm glad I welcome everyone who's online, on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, in this cold weather, uh, first I just want to uh, caution you that the third wave has started. So let's all be careful and stay safe. It's really a pleasure for me to welcome uh, Ubabu Moyo. It's good to see you, Baba. And uh, uh, it's great that you've written such a great book, Your Next Move. Career strategies to survive and thrive during COVID-19 and beyond. This is wonderful. It's uh, it's current. It's relevant. It's the issues that we're dealing with right now. Uh, let me give you his uh, background. Piwe Moyo is a sought-after, top-rated international keynote speaker, facilitator, and author based in South Africa. He's an adjunct faculty member at Gibbs. Henley and Vets Business Schools. Wow, that's great. <laughs> yeah, no, at Vets Business School. <laughs> oh, you must come in, in my office and come, let's have a chat. Uh, <laughs> I think we must uh, uh, come and have a chat there so that we, we can uh, make sure that you, you play a role at Vets Business School. As well as the founder and chief executive officer of at Paradigm People Solutions, Piwe is a lecturer in organizational be behavior for the new postgraduate diploma in strategic human resource management to be launched by Stellenbosch University in two 2021. An, org an organizational behaviorist is a past chairman of the South African Board for People Practice and past chapter president of Professional Speakers Association of Southern Africa. He's an author of three other books, Bulls and Bears, Life Lessons from Financial Markets, Stagnations Must Fall, 100 Practical Lessons That Will Activate Your Career Progression and Via Midway, Navigation, Navigating Personal and Career Transitions. As you can see, this man has written, and we're really proud of him. Uh, the effort that he has given in writing. That's what we want, in writing. Um, I don't need to introduce our confidence. The man is confident. And he has really initiated and led this initiative. And I'm very proud of you. I see you all over the place now. I see you on radio. I see you all over. That's what ULP is about. It's about unleashing and flying. And uh, but the biggest program that I really, that, that, that pleases me when you go out to the schools and talk to these young stars, 18-year-olds and teenagers, and, and inspire them and tell them they, instead of uh, going and messing up with their lives with Nyaupe and all the drugs and substance, they must go and write. And that, that to me, is what ELP is about, challenging those young people, especially teenagers in the townships. So I'm very proud of you. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Confidence, who's doing his great job of interviewing Mr. Sipiwe Moyo. Thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Khadebe, uh, eloquent as always. Uh, Mr. Moyo, thank you so much for honoring the invite, first and foremost. Thanks for having me, Confidence. Appreciate Wonderful. it. Wonderful. First time I ever uh, heard you speak. I don't think you'll remember this, but <laughs> it was many years ago. I don't know how many, maybe close to a decade. I, I was attending a, a youth conference. I think it was in Orange Farm. Mm. And uh, there were a range of speakers. And you were in the audience. You were not uh, on the speaker panel on the day. Mm. And the MC 
spotted you in the audience and he asked you to come on stage mm. and share a few words. And you delivered as if you had been preparing for two weeks. Is <laughs> it? And I, I was very impressed. I learned something quite important from you that day. Uh, that you know you should always be prepared for, yes. for an opportunity. Yes. So thank you for that. I don't no, know. Thank you. I remember that very well. Do you remember well. it? Ah. I remember it very, very well. Wonderful. I wonderful. think it was actually 2015. So 2015, not yeah. too long ago. Yeah, not too long. I think not six years long. ago. Wonderful, wonderful. Sure. Uh, we tend to celebrate the, the fruits, uh, the books, mm. the achievements. Mm. But before there is ever fruit, there is root. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about your roots? Mm -hmm. I believe Orange Farm is part of that story. It is. Just, uh, yeah, just where you come from, where you were raised, and mm -hmm. just your background. Every time I talk about that story and I emphasize Orange Farm, I always get people from where I was actually born saying, hey, when? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you elevate Orange Farm so much in yeah. the story? So I was, I was actually born in Mfulo South Soweto. All right. um, so I stayed in Mfulo South Soweto until I was a teenager. So I, I only moved to Orange Farm when I was a teenager. It's just um, Soweto is so famous, man. I don't want yeah. to make it extra famous. It doesn't famous. need any more publicity. Yeah, it doesn't need any more publicity. <laughs> so I always cut to the part where I was in Orange Farm. <laughs> and then people in Soweto, but it's Yeah. Uh, so I was born in Mfulo South, uh, but I grew up in, in Orange Farm. Uh -huh. I always trace my youth um, to Orange Farm. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, one of the, the beautiful things about your book uh, that I really loved while reading it is the authenticity. Yes. And... Uh, there's, there's two personalities, not mm. that, uh, <laughs> but only multiple personalities yeah. order, but there's two personalities that come through, but yes. I love the balance of the two personalities. One is Spijo. Yes. Spijo, who, who comes from Orange Farm. Yes. Who listens to Zola and Casper. Yes. <laughs> who, who dances to my piano. Yes. <laughs> and then there is Mr. Moyo. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Moyo, who lectures at Vets Business School, yeah. uh, who has a master's degree studying towards a, a PhD. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in corporate South Africa, can Spijo and Spiwe coexist? Yeah. Do, we, do we leave Spijo at the, at the door when we enter the boardroom? Yeah. Or is, does Spijo have a, have a place in the boardroom? Uh, Spijo has a place. I think, you know, managing your career is all about understanding and managing dualities. Mm. It's about understanding that it's, an, it's not an either or, it's an end. Mm. Um, being your authentic self is so critical in people understanding that they have a space in corporate South Africa. Um, they have a space in business conferences that are held where I have the privilege of, 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 of speaking in the business school environment where I have the privilege of teaching. Duality is very important. What, what, what starts appearing very, very quickly in Spijo and Spiwe, is that it's not a gimmick. This is my authentic self. Um, but there comes a point when you have to dish out content and so that people see the substance of who you are. Yeah. So it's just about managing uh, dualities. Uh, I'll tell you a story. I think in the 2015 Orange Farm Conference that you are in, um, we, we, we also had Umgane mm. Mtunzi. You would know Umgane, former president of the BMF. Yes, sir. Um, who I think is a COO at, 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 yes, at Con right now. Oh, so he left mm -hmm. Masmat, I think, is at EdCon right now. Mm -hmm. So Mnana said something very, very powerful in that 2015 conference. He says to me, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things around diversity and inclusion is that you don't want to take a guy from Sibukeng is from Sibukeng and put him at an exco, and then that same guy then behaves like everybody in the exco. And then, because what then happens is that you miss what you want this person to do at the exco. They're supposed to raise divergent views. They're supposed to, to raise a, a view of another world that other people don't know. Yeah. And so that's what Spijo does uh, in, in the places that I'm in. I, I want people to understand the environment I grew up in. I want people to understand the environment I'm still part of, that Ikasi, is not some dilapidated place where there is no substance, um, that we are not being gimmicky if we become ourselves, that our authentic selves is, does not have to assimilate 
to cooperate, we can provide good substance and still be ourselves. So that's the duality that I'm, I'm always, um, I'm not even trying to portray it's there. What I'm not doing, I'm not trying to hide it. Uh, because many people have thought you have to hide yourself in these spaces. Wonderful, wonderful. When the night is darkest, the stars shine brightest. Yes. Uh, you reference a song by uh, the great Zola Seven. Uh, can you just extrapolate a little bit? You know, in this season, um, it is a, a season of, of darkness in that there is the pandemic. You know, people are losing jobs. People are losing are losing uh, loved ones, people mm. are, are losing relationships and so mm. forth. And it is a dark night, yeah. but you say that when the night is darkest, the stars shine brightest. Can you just extrapolate a little bit? Yeah, based on that song by the great Zola Seven, uh, I'm going to shine in the dark like a star Zipsugu. Um, I'll sing all day in Jeng You start understanding that even in times like these, times that are really, really tough and times that are dark, stars shine the brightest. And the idea... Uh, behind that is just understanding that unprecedented times have hidden opportunities. Mm. So there are certain opportunities that are hidden in challenge and hidden in, in squalor and hidden in dark times that even when you cry, you must cry just for you to be able to see the kind of opportunities that, that we have. So, I mean, if you, if you just look in the business environment, um, Companies like Amazon, uh, companies like Netflix, companies like our own Showmax have started thriving in these dark times uh, because no matter how dark the night is, there's always a star that's going to emerge. And what I'm arguing is that um, that can be me, that can be you, that can be anyone else. Um, yes, we cry, but we also need to spot these hidden opportunities that are hidden in these dark times. Wonderful. I quote you, uh, and you say, the workplace is going to be a much better place post-COVID-19. Yes. It's a statement that uh, a lot of people might not agree with. Sure. Can you argue your point? Oh, yeah. I, th I, I definitely think the workplace is going to be a much better place um, post-COVID-19, provided, uh, provided leaders do not chicken out of this uh, moment that we have. We, we have a moment, and uh, it's going to be very tempting to chicken out. Uh, you know, when you study evolutionary biology um, and learn how species generally adapt, uh, you learn from evolutionary biology that when, you, when species are about to adapt, there's three things that happen there. So they have to, they have to think about what are we going to discard uh, in the new environment that we are going in. Uh, yes, it was working for us, but we have to discard it. They have to think about what are we going to preserve, um, the things that we, we used to do, and they'd still be useful in the new environment. But they also need to think about certain things that we're going to invent. Um, invent in, in a sense that they were not there before, but they are there now. So in, in, in the corporate environment, a space that I understand so well as an HR practitioner, there was a lot of things that we had been talking about that it is coming, it is mm. coming. Flexible workplace is coming, <laughs> yeah, and so on and so forth. So we spoke about a lot of things that have been accelerated by COVID-19. And if we don't chicken out and try and go back to the so-called uh, normal, we are going to see a better place. So we're going to see a place where a workplace um, is, is not a place. Work does not happen in the place. It's about production. We've always been talking about output-based remuneration in HR. And I think there's an opportunity to do that where it shouldn't matter where you are. As long as you produce, you should be fine. Uh, flexible working practices uh, are going to emerge. Uh, so all those kinds of things, if we do not chicken out as leaders, I do argue that the workplace is going to be much, much better. Uh, because suddenly we are going to spend our times on, on things that are productive. And, and many people have been arguing that we're going to have this hybrid workplace where you're at work at some point, at some point you are at home. And I think we are going to definitely have that. Wonderful. You spoke, uh, you mentioned that COVID has accelerated yes. quite a number of things that you thought were going to be you know, prevalent in 2030, but COVID has accelerated it to 10 years. Sure. One of the things that 
COVID has also accelerated and given rise to is the rise or increase of the side hustle. Yes. Now, for employers, uh, should they look at the side hustle as a negative thing? And how should employees approach the side hustle where everybody benefits? You know, there's, a st there's actually a study that was done in 2019 before COVID-19 that proved that side hustles, with, when they're handled properly, they, they have an ability to actually increase the production of the employee who's doing the side hustle. Wow. So in other words, if I feel that my side hustle is being embraced, um, I tend to work harder because I'm grateful so much to my employer for giving me an opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. But what has helped us during COVID is that suddenly performance management is outputs based, right? So you would know very quickly if my side hustle is affecting my work. Yes. Because we didn't really have tools to manage performance before. We, we managed performance by seeing you. As long as you were <laughs> at, your, at your desk, we assumed you were working. Yeah. But most companies have gotten better on managing performance based on the output. Mm. So now we can tell if your side hustle is affecting your work, and then we can have a conversation and say, no, 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 that, um, please make sure you keep the main thing the main thing, yeah. right? But those people who can manage it, especially if it, there is no conflict of interest, those people who can manage it can end up being more productive for their main employer because of just being grateful. So to the, to the employers, would you advise them to embrace uh, side hustles when you know, employees are going in the direction? I, I will, and I'll tell you why. I, I worked in HR before I started teaching and so on, and one of the funniest things we've seen in HR is that <laughs> so many people in, at work are doing side hustles anyway. anyway. <laughs> it, it's just, it's just what, even, even <laughs> what is funny is that the manager who wants to suppress the person is, doing, is doing also, as a, also as a side hustle because you're also an employee as well, yeah, right? Yeah, you yeah, also yeah. Do, so the main thing now is just to relax, I think, the draconian conflict of yeah. interest legislation that we kind of have, frameworks mm. and ethical frameworks that we have. Because what we don't want, obviously, is people influencing um, decisions that, you know, are benefiting them at work. Mm. If we manage the conflict of interest well and, and I'm selling whatever I'm selling and it doesn't affect uh, or conflict with my work, I think you should embrace it. Uh, and I think it needs to be a very open conversation yeah. that, look, I, I know you should be selling 10 things per week. That's your main thing. Mm. If you start selling seven, we might have to have a different conversation about your side hustle. So that's why I'm saying uh, the, the, uh, the fact that our performance management is becoming so advanced allows us to have a different conversations about side hustles. Wonderful, wonderful. Just for the viewers uh, at home, uh, on your tablets, on your phones, if you have any questions for Mr. Moyo, please put them in the comment section and we'll ask them uh, towards the end uh, of the interview. As people, we dislike comfort, discomfort, you know, mm -hmm. um, and change. Mm -hmm. How important is career adaptability, especially mm -hmm. in, this, in this current season? It is critical. Um, it is critical. Let me wear my Mr. Moyo head, as okay. you say. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Moyo. <laughs> Let me wear that head. Uh, so, so what happens is we all have what we call career anxiety right now. Will I have a job um, two years from now? Will I have a job next year? Will I have money to finance whatever I'm doing? So career anxiety is a thing, and it's a construct that people study. Um, but what is very cool is that studies have shown um, that career anxiety is negatively correlated to this concept called career adaptability. In other words, if you have career adaptability, you'll have less career anxiety, oh. um, which is really cool because if you can increase this, then your, your anxiety levels go down. Um, so it's a beautiful construct. And we know two things about career adaptability, by the way. We know first that it can be measured. So we can measure the amount of adaptability a person has. Number two, we know that it is, it is cultivatable, um, which is good because once you know that you can 
actually teach yourself how to be adaptable. It's cool. Otherwise, it's a matter of saying, ah, some people are adaptable and some are, are not adaptable, which doesn't help us. But since we know that it is cultivatable, we can teach people how to be adaptable. You can teach yourself how to be adaptable, which is really useful for us in this environment uh, that we're in. Because those of us who might not be adaptable by nature, suddenly we can put ourselves in situations where we can increase the amount of care adaptability we have. Brilliant. We were talking off air about uh, branding. Yes. And when we speak of career adaptability, yeah. how important is it to retain your brand? So if I know Mr. Moyo as a, as a speaker, lecturer, mm. um, if I see him doing something that is totally <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, if yeah. I can use that, that yeah. terminology, yeah. doesn't that impact how, how I view Mr. Moyo's brand? Yeah. And what are the so the short term versus the long term as well? Mm. So how, how should people navigate those particular issues in respect to career adaptability? I think that's a, that's such a brilliant point. Um, it's a point that businesses think about a lot. So if you think about a business like Bitvest uh, as an example, um, a, Bitvest is is a company that that just owned everything, yeah. right? And they uh, there was a time. Bitvest just owns the cleaning company yeah. and, the, and and everything. <laughs> and, uh, the <laughs> and the soap that you are using and the security yeah. at the time. And, and I think the, the founder, I think it's Branch of it, did an incredible, incredible job in doing that. But when he leaves, um, people like Sis Mpum, who's, uh, who's the CEO, starts to say, we need to look at a smart diversification. We need to make sure that we do not diversify to a point that we can't focus. Uh, so businesses think about that, and, and individuals need to think about that as well. That you don't, you don't diversify to a point that you lose this core brand that you have. Um, and, 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 and I write in the book about an example which many people will relate with the speech or element uh, coming through. So there's this guy called DJ Maporisa. Ne? DJ Maporisa, for those who don't know, is, is a young man who's currently producing um, Ama Piano music. Yeah. So two, three years ago, he formed a duo with another guy called Gabza the Small. They created Scorpion Kings, and they've been giving us hit after hit after hit after hit. But one of the things that he does so well, in my view, is he introduced another persona called Madumani to try out the rapping thing, uh -huh. you know? Um, and it's not him. So uh, if that thing flopped, we would say, no, Maporisa is fine, you know? So it's him rapping, but with a totally different persona so that it doesn't mess around with the core brand. Wow. And I think sometimes we have to think like that. We have to say, firstly, how can I try and diversify and keep my brand? But secondly, and more importantly, is that the slash career that we have now, yeah. slash this, slash this, exactly. slash this, it's very important to... Make sure that you do things that you know, right? Because if you start doing all the slashes uh, of things that you actually don't know, you don't invest in, you don't put in the time, then you also mess up with the, with the other brand. We know you need to survive, but if you have to position yourself for something different, at least put in the work, yeah. at least respect the craft, yeah. at least develop it before... Uh, you put yourself out there. Otherwise, it actually confuses people and messes up with your entire brand. Wonderful, wonderful. In times of crisis, people's emotions tend to flare up, understandably. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the points you speak about is the need for emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. I mean, in OB, it's, it's, it's something that we've always been speaking about. Mm -hmm. But I think in this particular period, it's something that we really need to highlight. Yeah. Um, how should people increase the, what they call the EQ mm, in this mm. particular moment? You know, I've come to a conclusion during this period in COVID that the first thing you want before you even date or marry somebody, mm. you must understand, uh, forget anything else. Just ask them to do some psychometric assessment. Check their <laughs> EQ, um, EQ and, and all of those things have become more important than anything else. Wow. Because... Imagine being stuck with somebody in the house 
who has no emotional regulation at all. Mm. Every time they're stressed, they make everybody else stressed, they're grumpy, and, and so on. And it, that's not a good thing. And, and I think even the way I was arguing the other day, that even the way we raise boys, um, one of the mistakes we make when we raise boys is that we focus, at, we, we focus less on their being and we keep telling them about what they must do, uh, right? Do this, hustle, uh, protect, provide, da, da, da. And we don't focus on their being, on the kind of person that you become. So issues like emotional intelligence uh, are very important. And the first uh, thing that you look at when you look at emotional intelligence is self-awareness. Do I know myself? Do I know what triggers me? Um, do I understand what are my strengths? Do I understand what are my weaknesses? Do I understand what happens when I have pressure? Uh, do I understand the kind of person that I have? Do I understand when I need to dial up certain behaviors and when do I have to dial them down? Um, and during COVID-19, when suddenly we are spending so much time at home, you start understanding how important that is. Um, instead of saying, ah, uh, he's hot, I'm marrying him, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> um, there are other things that are important. Yeah. At, at work, Emotionally intelligent leaders are the best leaders to work for uh, because what they know how to do is that they know how to use a pressure cooker um, kind of environment. They know that in order to get the best out of the person, I have to increase a little bit of uh, pressure. There must not be too much in the comfort zone. They must always be in the stretch zone. They must feel stretched, but I must never allow them to be in the panic zone. Uh, so they guide you so nicely. Uh, they stretch you, but they never allow you to get into that panic zone that we need. So emotional intelligence is very critical uh, for us right now. Awesome. Related to that is the issue of uh, mental wellness, yes. mental health. Uh, you, you commentated on uh, the tennis player o Osaka. Yes, yes. yes. Naomi. At, no, Osaka Naomi, mm. uh, who decided that she, she was not going to do the post-match press conference because of mental health issues. Yes. Uh, in this current uh, crisis, a lot of people are going through mm. uh, mental health issues. How should leaders and co-workers approach such uh, such issues when when colleagues or even leaders mm. uh, raise their hand and say, but I'm going through X, Y, Z? I think to answer that, I want to just tell you a story. So my daughter, who is 11, uh, does this very, very cu cute thing. Every time she drops a glass or a plate, uh, she screams, I'm okay, I'm okay. Yeah. Uh, and every time she does that, I'm like, ah, baby, well, now you're trying to trick me. <laughs> <laughs> what about that place? <laughs> you know? What about that class? Yeah. But I think, you know, inadvertently, when she does that, mm. she's almost inviting me to think very carefully yeah. about what is important. Yes. Um, yes. That yes. class, that mm. 20 rands class or her well-being. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what leadership right now during times of crisis should be about. If, if someone who generally performs, someone who generally does well at work, if they drop a ball uh, right now, instead of shouting about the class, ask them how they are. Uh, show that compassion. Um, ask them, are you well? Are you coping? And if you do that, uh, it has so much impact on the person to a point that when they are well, hey, they will fight for you. Yeah. Man. They will be yeah. like, I want to give that discretionary effort uh, that we want. So just try and do that. So before we shout at people, just think, man, Spiwa is not like this. Yeah. Maybe it's just the way he's dealing with this. Um, and, and it's about time uh, that we, first we communicate our boundaries, which is what Naomi has done. Uh, communicate boundaries, uh, but also other people respect other people's boundaries. Um, it's really not about you. If someone tells you, that if I do that press conference, the level of anxiety that I have to deal with is huge. Mm. They've told you, yeah. you know, yeah. just understand and embrace people's boundaries, especially right now. And, and, and the corporate world is starting to learn that. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I was saying that the workplace is going to be a better place, suddenly issues of employee assistant programs, suddenly issues of wellness have taken center stage in, in the corporate environment. And two years ago, ah, uh, no. <laughs> you want to talk about what? <laughs> it's not in our vocabulary. No, I mean, really. Um, you can't do that. Yeah. I actually, 
I remember doing some work in the bank and and people were so nervous about even admitting they've made a mistake. Mm. Um, just that idea of I've made a mistake, boss, was such a huge thing. And I think that culture is, is changing. Leaders are learning that providing that psychological safety uh, for people to approach you is actually a good thing. If you don't have it, people hide things from you. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, you quote uh, Mr. Vent Hanna, who said, it is not enough to stay up the steps. We must step up the stairs. Yes. How important is proactivity, pro proactivity in this season uh, with special focus on proactive career behaviors? Uh, so proactive career behaviors are these behaviors that are antecedents to career success. Um, so there's a lot of research that proves that if you can displace these PCBs, uh, proactive career behaviors, it leads to what we call both objective and subjective career success, which is so powerful because the way we measure career success is in two ways. So firstly, there are objective metrics. Um, you earn a little bit more, yeah. you've advanced, you've climbed the ladder, uh, and so on. Those are objective. But subjective career success is about how you also feel um, about your success. So if, for example, you have a promotion, but it has made you so miserable that you've become a terrible dad at home. Uh, subjectively, you can say, I, I don't feel like I'm succeeding. But these PCBs, they help with both, yeah. um, both so objective and, and, and subjective career success. What are they? Is these ideas that we have to exhibit proactive career behaviors. So this is the time where, without even telling employees, every leader wants to have a proactive employee wants to have an employee that is trying to solve problems instead of creating them, wants an employee who shows a little bit of initiative, wants an employee who takes responsibility, who own their piece of work, yeah. because you are dealing with a lot. So the last thing you need is, is someone who still comes to you to do whatever. So exhibiting these proactive care behaviors like showing initiative, um, like being adaptable, um, and, and all of those, those are great kind of competencies we need uh, to survive uh, this kind of period when, when you are employed. Wonderful. One of the trends, I, I don't think trends is the right word, uh, but trends for lack of a better word, that has come up is digitization of businesses. Yes. I mean, even in your own industry, the speaking industry, yeah. uh, I believe the, the live conferences, they've dialed down quite a bit, but the online webinars have increased. Mm. What would you say to somebody who is, is in business, maybe an entrepreneur, or even an employee? Mm. What would you advise them in terms of digitization? Yo, I would say digital is not a nice to have anymore. Mm. It is essential. Yeah. It is essential to, to survive. Um, imagine Imagine if I said, ah, this Zoom thing, I can't. <laughs> it's <laughs> can't, not for me. <laughs> I, this MS Teams thing is not for me. Yeah. I would not have had any income <laughs> in the last uh, 16 months or so. Yeah. Um, and, and for me, that is just the basics. Mm. That is just the basics. Each and every person has to think about the digitized version of their job. Yeah. And, and think very carefully. It's about that future orientation that says, in the short term, how could this job be digitized? Um, I can tell you now, you know, every company have some kind of a digital transformation strategy. Every company right now. Um, and so embracing digital is, is a matter of survival. And so we need to think about what, what is the digital digitized version of my current job and make sure that I climb that learning curve as quickly as possible in order for me to just uh, survive. Um, and it's not, as, it's not as daunting as people make it out to be. Yeah. Yes, yes, I think when you, when you start, it's hard. Um, but once you think a little bit carefully about some of those things, you realize that some of these things are not as daunting. Uh, yes, we want face-to-face. -face. Yes, this sharing of screen can be tiring, <laughs> uh, but you need to think about it. What helps is, is to think about your own job, your own industry. And I always argue, if you never spend time
thinking about the future of your industry, you could be one innovation away from being redundant. Mm. Just one. Yeah. Uh, so one innovation could make you literally redundant. So I think we need to think about that. I think we need to have a very careful analysis of how our, our professions, mm. our jobs are, Im are emerging. So just to bring it back home to you, sure. your journey from last year, March, mm. when the announcement was made, mm. up to now, mm. what has that journey been in terms of digitization, in terms of mm. evolving mm. Uh, with, with the status quo? <laughs> I, was actually, I was actually looking at a photo of my first virtual session I've done. Yeah. I think it was terrible. <laughs> it, was, it was terrible, terrible. Yeah. I was sitting in some dodgy uh, <laughs> chair with some dodgy light uh, and, and, and no, no extra mic, yeah. relying on the computer mic. And it was just so bad. Yeah. Um, and people forgave us for that. Yes. You know, I, I went to teach with that. People forgave us. Mm. Um, uh, but there comes a point when people say, hey, Apple, you yeah. know, it's been a while. Yeah. You have to improve your yeah. thing. So, so not only has it involved in terms of just the quality being a little bit better in terms of audio, in terms of video, mm -hmm. in terms of nice background, in terms of that, but also just understanding that taking the things that you do uh, in person and converting them directly into online does not work. Mm -hmm. So because of this environment, we had to now redesign some of the stuff that I yeah. do um, and not think that digitizing means taking a, a PDF of what you do and just putting it online. It doesn't work. Uh, so now, even the way we design some of the talks that I do, some of the teaching that I do, you can tell that how man, there's been a bit of growth in this thing. Yeah. And I think all of us need to go through that. You, you, you should look back at the stuff that you used to do and think, uh, <laughs> that's what progress is about. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, you spoke about uh, the stars mm. in, 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 the, in the darkest night. Sure. And one of your comments you made on social media was that you, I think you had an engagement at six uh, with one company in Western Cape, and then there was another one at nine with one in Jobek, and in the olden days, yeah. that wouldn't have been ah, possible. that's impossible. So, so, so those are some of the stars that yeah. we are seeing. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a term in psychology that they call post-traumatic growth. Yeah. And, and post-traumatic growth is, is the idea that there are, certain, uh, there are certain levels of growth that can come from trauma. Wow. Um, the, I think the famous book by Nassim Taleb talks about... Um, in, in times where there's black swan events and there's argument about whether this is a black swan or not. But the idea, so he says, in this kind of environment, there are people who are, uh, who's, who are gonna realize that their careers were fragile and fragile means they break. It's mm -hmm. like a glass, uh, when, when you throw a glass down, it's going to break. That's what glasses do, yeah. they are fragile. Yeah. Uh, but there are people's careers that are going to be robust. In other words, they'll remain at the same level. It's like a tree when there's a wind. It will be shaken, but it will stay there because the tree is robust. But then he talks about anti-fragility, which means there are people who are going to grow uh, after these kinds of black swan events, yeah. which, is, which is the idea that you can grow beyond what you were even before the crisis. And that's what you're talking about. The fact that when you start looking at virtual, um, there was this day, and it was an anomaly for me to be able to do three events per yeah. day. It was quite an anomaly. I was, I was quite excited about it. Yeah. But when I think about it, virtually you can do that, but there is no way you can do that yeah. in person, uh, particularly when you think about the fact that that other event was in Cape Town, the other one was in Jovek. That's It's an impossibility. Yeah. So that's where you start seeing that mm, <laughs> the, the stars do definitely emerge during night. <laughs> Wonderful. One of the uh, strategies you speak about in the book, uh, the painkiller strategy. Yeah. Very interesting terminology as well. Yeah. And, and then you compare it to the vitamin, painkiller yes. vitamin. Can you just extrapolate a little bit on that? Yeah. The first time I heard of, a, of the painkiller versus vitamin analogy, we were... Uh, so, Simpio Masiza was having a conference at UJ. Um, and there was 
I think it was uh, Madi Mudiso or something like that, uh, who was talking about entrepreneurship, that as an entrepreneur, you have to think uh, very carefully about whether your business is a painkiller or is a vitamin. Uh, that that when, when companies think of you, uh, do they think about um, we need to get spiway quickly uh, and it must em eliminate a bit of pain and then go? Or you could be a vitamin that you take daily oh. um, and therefore you have a sustainable kind of business. Hmm. So it's an interesting one because in entrepreneurship, you actually uh, can be a painkiller or a vitamin depending on your strategy. Vitamin means long-term contracts. Um, you know, uh, but in our careers right now, I realized that a painkiller is what people needed to transition um, during COVID. So in other words, uh, if, you, if you are a painkiller, that means you're still going to have a little bit of business right now because it's urgent for people to have a painkiller. Yeah. It's urgent for people to eliminate that pain right now. Um, but you need to think long term whether that works for you. I don't know if it makes sense because yeah, no, yeah. Um, when, when, when people have an immediate pain, they're probably not going to buy vitamins, so you're not going to benefit. But over a long term, you could probably benefit as a, as, as a vitamin that people take on a daily basis. So if, if, if I'm listening to you right now and I, I recognize that my offering or my, my business model is a painkiller, mm. should I be thinking about becoming more of a, of a vitamin? Or the fact that I'm making money from being a painkiller, uh, it sustains me? Albeit is not a good long-term strategy. Yeah. What should I be thinking? So that's that an interesting one because uh, some, some people would say being a painkiller is the best. Mm. And I've had so many arguments about that. Mm. Um, I, think, I think for me, the way I look at this is, you know when you have a roof leak ne, at home? Uh, when you have a roof leak, um, you can't say, no, I don't believe in temporary solutions. I'm going to wait until I've engaged a construct, construction person who's going to come in six months. You can't. Mm. You must do a very quick thing to eliminate the leak. Otherwise, it ruins everything. Yeah. And so that means you take a bit of silicone, you go and close there, and you're probably going to have um, a few days of, of, of no rain coming. You know. um, so that's a painkiller thing for me. That's good. Mm. You're going to get a little bit of business. But you don't then sit and say, uh, silicone has solved my problem yeah. <laughs> because it hasn't. Uh, it hasn't. Yeah. If you uh, eventually that thing is going to 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 emerge that hey, there's still that crack. So yeah. it buys you time, yeah. but then you must start thinking. Okay, now that I've bought time, how do I make sure I plan my thing properly? Yeah. So I think if you are a painkiller, it will benefit you now. But there comes a point where you have to say, uh, I can't sustain a business on this. Yeah. I can't sustain a business on this. I need to move up the value chain. I need to move up and be in the rooms when people are having uh, the conversations instead of being called just to eliminate pain quickly. Wonderful. Uh, just on the roof leaks, uh, sure. you say in the book, uh, roof leaks are not created by the storm. They are revealed by the storm. Yes. And I, I really love that quote. Can yeah. you just extrapolate a little bit on that? Hey, now you read this thing, ne? <laughs> <laughs> Always be prepared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are not, the roof leaks are not created by the storm. They're just revealed. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the idea that, so I talked there about career resilience. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the idea of resilience is that roof leaks expose how vulnerable uh, your building was, mm. right? Um, the opposite of career resilience is career vulnerability. So if, you, if your career is not resilient, it's vulnerable. Yeah. If it's not vulnerable, it's resilient. Yeah. So, so you start realizing that, oops, my career was vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I started realizing during COVID that my career was vulnerable. I had never thought there could be something um, that could disturb my, my momentum in the speaking game. I was like, yeah. me, nah. <laughs> Ferrar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's a boy. <laughs> But then I realized it's vulnerable. Yeah. It was not created by COVID, but it was revealed by uh, COVID. By, by COVID. Wow. And so now 
what I've had to do and what I'm hoping that everybody has to do is to have at confront facts and say, how vulnerable is my career and how do I build resilience wow. in this career? And the way you build resilience um, is through a few things. Attending another course, um, making sure that uh, informal learning opportunities like this one, this is proper learning, yeah. you know? Um, <laughs> this is proper, proper learning. Informal <laughs> learning is so critical for us now that you can't always be able to go attend a course all the time. So if you can be on YouTube, on Facebook right now and, and learning like this in books and whatever, we always have to be learning. Um, and that's how you make yourself uh, resilient. Um, you just accelerate your learning curve. Wonderful, wonderful. Another um, interesting idea that uh, you've written about uh, is platforming your career. Yeah, yeah. Platforming your career. Yeah. When we think of our careers, we, we seldom think of how to platform them. Yeah. But can you just share on that a bit? Yeah, so hey, the platform economy is an exciting, exciting thing. Yeah. Um, the platform economy, um, I think, you know, if you think about Silicon Valley and how they're obsessed with platforms, mm. and I think it's, it's up to us to think about this as well. So the idea of a platform economy is the idea of Uber, is the idea of Airbnb, is the idea of matching uh, the buyer and the seller um, and benefiting from that relationship, yeah. right? Um, I think I, I was getting tired of being in conferences where people said, because I'm in conferences all the time, Uber owns no vehicles. <laughs> Airbnb, Airbnb owns no house. Owns no ha <laughs> but it's the truth. Yeah. It's the truth. <laughs> it's the truth. It's just that we, we, we love it and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So I was thinking about it, about this and saying, is it possible at all to create a platform where we could match uh, people in whatever capacity that mm. I do, in whatever you do, uh, and so on? And, it's, and, and, for me, and for me, it's always, always, always possible. And, and what is interesting is that many people always think of platform businesses as only the apps yeah. and so on. Um, a friend created a marketplace kind of thing where people apply for home loans and matches, matches the home loans with all the banks. Um, getting into that space of mortgage originators, one application, but it goes to six banks. Mm. Um, he is matching the, the, the banks and the buyer. What, what is that for you? What is that for you? Yeah. In your kind of skill, how can you benefit from this platform economy? And that's how, that's, that's the kind of mindset we need um, to think about in these tough times. In your field or when you're in your head as, as an HR practitioner, yes. uh, how would that work? You mentioned yeah. in the book um, a conversation you had with a friend mm -hmm. and how possibly, you know, the, the model of the, uh, the scouts, yeah. for lack of a better term, yeah. becoming obsolete. Yeah. How would platforming work in, in an HR environment? So a friend of mine who's an HR executive was frustrated during COVID. Um, so we were, we were just chatting and, and she says to me, um, look, we all understand that we're going to have to deal with freelancers and people in the gig economy and, and all of that. So the idea that talent management is shifting from owning talent to accessing talent. It's a very powerful thing that it's a shift that is happening. That you don't have to buy and own talent. You just tap into talent wherever you can find them. Um, but he says, I don't have time to, to do that. As an HR executive, I don't have time to do that. Yes, we can't do maybe the old system of labor broking, yep. but I still want someone who can help me tap into this talent quite quickly as an HR executive. And that's where I think the platform economy in HR needs to be. Who, who organizes the freelancers? Um, who organizes the, the people in the gig economy and try and match them with corporate South Africa? Who needs structure? They need to invoice one person. One of the things you can't afford as an, as an executive um, is to have 17 invoices with pure invoicing 200 rand and then confidence another 100 <laughs> rand. You just don't need that drama. You, yeah. you, know? uh, you need someone who can. And so there's a bit of space of something that we're thinking about there. Wonderful, wonderful. We're looking forward to that innovation. Yes, thank you. Uh, one of the realities of this crisis is that some are going to cash in. Mm. 
And I mean, when you think of a time like this where there's so much loss and, and heartache and heartbreak, the, the term cash in is you almost feel guilty yeah. just mentioning cash yeah. in. Yeah. But it's one of the realities. Should people look to cash in yeah. in this particular? It's, a, it's an interesting. I mean, if you just look at um, the moves in, in, in the corporate space, you, you understand that there are companies that are going to cash in, you know. You understand, I mean, if you just look in South Africa, I remember at the start of, at the start of, 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 of lockdown, uh, Mr. Price, Mr. Price, who has a lot of cash, they hold a lot of cash, they were sniffing around and many people thought, many people they were going to buy. So as you know, Edcon, Edcon was selling at the time and, and there, was, there, there was thoughts that they might buy the jet part of Edcon yeah. because I think retaliability was buying the other part. Um, and they were shopping around. Eh? Yeah. They never made that transaction. But I'm telling you now, because when you have cash, you look at the vulnerable businesses and you make an offer. Yeah. Um, and I mean, there are negotiations now around Adapt IT. People are making an offer, uh, Adapt IT right now. People are trying to buy. So when you have cash, you're going to cash in. And businesses do that all the time. I'm, I'm telling you that even as individuals, um, we need to cash in on whatever's happening. Legally, um, there are, unfortunately, there are businesses that are going to become cheap. If you have a bit of capital, buy that business, save people jobs, but you're going to get it much at a much better rate. If you have a bit of capital, um, which is another nice way to have the same money, uh, <laughs> buy, cash yeah. in, yeah. save people's jobs. Yeah. It's to the benefit of both, both. you and the employees, um, and it's a good business decision to do that. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. So no, you're not being a voucher. You're actually no, saving people's jobs. You are not. You are saving people's jobs. Um, you have a bit of a capital. Um, I mean, look at what is happening in the retail sector. Did you know that in the retail sector, for the first time ever, retailers are going to their landlords and say, um, "We think we want to pay revenue. We want to pay rent based on the revenue we make now." That's cashing in. Yeah. So before COVID, they, many of them could not do that. But now they realized that, oops, um, paying fixed rent is dangerous for us because we are not getting traffic. They go to the landlords and say, there's a bit of an opportunity here. Can't we base our rent based on the revenue we make? When we have an upside, you benefit. Yeah. When we have a downside, we benefit. And that's what cashing is. It's not, it, it's a proper win-win yeah. where... Um, you just find creative ways of benefiting from the crisis. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, you're a soccer man. Yeah. I believe you're a Pirates fan like myself. For life. Like in Tatarev. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bagane is dominating. Was I, was I going to be put out of here now, Pungan, if I wasn't? <laughs> like, cut, cut. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things you admonish against is scoring on goals. Yes. In this particular season. Yes. Can you just extrapolate on that? You I I had a very difficult conversation with 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 one person right in the middle of the first lockdowns. Mm. Um who was who who was complaining a lot about the fact that, you know, my my boss is asking me to do things that are outside of my job description. I didn't sign up for this. Um I need structure. I need, and I had a very nice conversation with them. Luckily, they did tell me, and and I said, "Hey, daughter, you don't want to score own goals like that. Not now. Yeah. Refusing to do something because it's not in your job description in an era where there is so much unpredictability is an own goal. Mm. You don't want to be doing that. You don't want to be that person. Nobody knows, and nobody expected the kind of situation that we are in." So trying to stick to a job description is an own goal. Um, trying to say, I will not do it because this and this, it's an own goal. The kind of attitude you need right now is, I'll raise my hand and then I'll Google the thing. Say yes and find, yes, out, find, find out, out later. later yeah. Or go on YouTube. <laughs> There's very little things you can't get on YouTube. You know, try your yeah. best. Because wow. your boss also doesn't know. Yeah. You know? They're just trying, and they just need somebody who's going to be a little bit cooperative, yeah. who's going to say, hey, boss, I really don't know it, but uh, watch me. I'm going to find these things. 
Um, so scoring own goals is about having a fixed mindset during this period instead of a growth mindset. Wonderful, wonderful. Some questions from our online viewers from Ditawa, Lucy Maraga. <laughs> and the question goes, uh, personality profiles generally help you understand your strengths and weaknesses and use this knowledge, understanding to cope with whatever comes up, say at work. Mm -hmm. Why is there this thing? Why is there this general view that one should not bring one's personality to the office? Yo, that's, that's, uh, that's a very interesting one because uh, I think one of the things that has happened in, in the workplace, probably started by Marcus Birmingham, is the strength revolution that we need to try our best to place people in places that are their strengths instead of their weaknesses. There, there was an old thinking that suggested that people should not bring themselves at work. And, and it's an old thinking. It's a, uh, but we, people have a different view now that we definitely need people to bring themselves, to bring their strengths, bring their uniqueness, bring their creativity, um, and, and, and be authentic and so on and so forth. What, what I think people were trying to say is that even though you bring your authentic self, you must just understand when to dial things up and when to dial them yeah. down. That's all. Yeah. Uh, bring yourself, uh, but just dial up and down because you also work with other people. That's why when, when industrial psychologists do um, personality assessments like, like the insights, like the MPTI, they try and do it in a, in a team environment. So if you do it in, in your team, it's so great because even though you understand that you are leaning towards this energy, then you understand confidence um, is like this as well. And then you adapt a little bit uh, as well when you chat to, to your colleague. So if I understand that you prefer a lot of detail to make your decision as my manager, then I know when I bring things to you, I must bring detail. Yeah. If I understand that your strength is that you want high level impact stuff, then I understand how I must deal with you. So we all need to tone, uh, dial things up, and they use this language, dial things up and dialing them down in order to ensure that there's team cohesiveness, but we must still bring ourselves. So it's just understanding you bring yourself and then you understand how to work with other people. That's all it is. Wonderful. <coughs> Question from uh, King Tsepom Khoto. What is CPO's advice for young black people who might think there are no, there are no alternatives for them given the rate of, of unemployment and the impact of COVID-19? Um, I, I would say, you know, uh, the, uh, the unemployment numbers that were, were, were published last week are devastating, right? They're devastating and and, and we, must, we must engage um, our authorities, our leaders, we must engage them vehemently on these things and say, do your part. Uh, and we must do not all, and we must try and do our part. One of the things that I'm advocating for is just understanding that there are certain practical skills that we must get in order for us to survive, right? The, I think I say this in the book that we, I think we've sold the national qualifications framework well, too well. Ne? Uh -huh. That people have started thinking that the only way I'm going to do a course is if it's NQF yes. aligned, otherwise I'm not doing it. Um, and, I think, and I think that's not the idea that we wanted. There are certain skills that you must do in order to survive. So if I think about um, if you're a young person and unemployed and, and you know how to work with your hands, there's nothing wrong with doing a two-week uh, two week plumbing course quickly where you can be able to fix a few plumbing issues um, very, very quickly. Uh, that gives you a little bit of money. And then eventually you can step that up and become a qualified artisan in the future. But it helps you because you're not hungry now. So there are certain times where we have to be very practical about our skills acquisitions acquire skills that can give you um, money now to survive now while you have a long-term plan and sell that skill uh, to anybody who will be able, willing to pay it. Wonderful. Uh, from Richabani Kope, 
Hola, Spicho. Thanks again for this informative session. Uh, I can listen to you the whole week. <laughs> my, <laughs> Thanks, que Rich. my question to you is that as a person uh, who has people uh, reporting under, how do I deal with an employee under these circumstances who is not coming to the party uh, in as far as the deliverables are concerned without appearing to be micromanaging them? Yeah. Uh, I think I think it's a difficult one, Richard, but, uh, but it needs a very frank conversation. It needs a very, very frank conversation to say, um, uh, look, man, you know, you are not coming to the party. One of the things I've learned um, in leadership is that holding people accountable is actually doing them a favor. When I was younger, I always felt uncomfortable with holding staff members accountable. And I thought I was doing them a favor by not holding them accountable. But I've learned that when I hold you accountable, when I tell you when your work is sloppy, uh, I'm actually doing you a favor because I am trying to lift you uh, to a particular level. Yeah. So let's hold them accountable. Let's not be, let's not beat around the bush. Let's have frank conversation that hold people accountable. Um, and, and you can use different ways to do this. You know, I, I remember um, in corporate, sometimes you, you, you can try and switch hats. So you can wear a coaching hat first. And it's always good to wear a coaching hat first and say, look, what I'm seeing right now is that you are not coming, you are not delivering as you should. Um, what is it that I can do to help you? What is it that you think I can do as a leader to help you? And you try the coaching approach. Um, if you have to pair that person with another person, you do it. If you go get them external help, do it. If it's a skill issue, you do it. Um, and then after you've done that, there comes a point where you must have the tough conversation that, hey, dude, you're not coming to the party. Because what happens is that sometimes leaders, we make the mistake. We just think, oh, God, this one doesn't perform. And then we take that work, we give it to the one who's performing. And then that one who's performing ends up being discouraged because they can see this one is not performing. Now they have to carry this other person and it's discouraging to them. Uh, from Nonoki Honari, uh, women in executive positions, why are we so scared to fill those positions? Uh, sure. I, I am not, I'm not sure whether it's an issue of being scared. Yes. I, I'm not sure, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Um, you know, representation is so important. Um, one, of the, one of the objectives of the ULP Authors Forum is that we must have um, our own people writing our own stories. Yes, sir. Um, and and when, when Us Java from Soweto sees Us Pijo from Orange Farm writing a book, you start saying, Okay, I can write, Good, man. Yeah. I really don't have to be Stephen King and, you know, <laughs> I write uh, in a particular way. I can write like this. Yeah. Uh, and so before we accuse women about being scared, we must also evaluate whether the environment um, that we have created in these spaces is actually conducive yeah. and, and inviting yeah. and um, for, for women leaders to take charge. Because I can tell you now, um, I've, I've had the privilege of reporting to a lot of female leaders. They're not scared. Uh, but what happens is um, we need more people. We need the corporate environment. We need uh, all the environments that we work in to be very comfortable with employing uh, women. I'm, I'm not convinced it's scared. I actually read a book called Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. Yeah, you know? on Facebook, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so Sheryl Sandberg talks about a very interesting thing. And she says, one of the things that actually created glass ceiling in the workplace is what happens at home, um, which is very fascinating. Mm. So if I, as a husband as well, um, inadvertently sometimes create a situation where, uh, in fact, I think there's this exa exact example where if my, if my wife is working in the office and they're not home at half past six and I call, baby, are you safe? I think I'm talking about safe. What she's hearing is, oh, you must come home now, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so as a husband as well, as a partner at home, I must reflect on those things 
because they could be preventing my wife from pursuing her own goals. Um, and then what are some of the other things that we do in the workplace as men that create an impression that I, you are not welcome uh, here? And, and those are the conversations that, uh, that we need to have. I, I'm not convinced people are scared. Um, recently, you were inducted into the South African, South African, Southern African Speakers Hall of Fame. Hey, Wena. It's in your ganyo. And from tonight, we can see why. <laughs> uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a title that uh, normally uh, is reserved for the, the men with the Grey bushes yeah. beneath uh, the, the the chins. Yeah. Uh, yours is still quite black. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how was that? So you know, being inducted in the Hall of Fame of Speakers was incredible, man. It was just, it was absolutely incredible for a few reasons. For a few reasons. First of all, when we are still ni nice and young, it's quite cool because generally people kind of wait for you to be a bit older because you would have acquired experience and so on. And that makes a lot of sense. So that was cool. The, the other reason it was also cool is that um, to get my peers to appreciate my, my speaking is very, very cool because yeah. this is the kind of person I bring in corporate conferences. And when I started, when I started it was as if that's not acceptable. When I'm you joke too much. When are you hoi your speech or jokes too much? Yeah. You are too this, too that, too that. So just being appreciated in my authentic self, mm. that was very, very cool as well. So I appreciated the honor very, very much. Wonderful. Congratulations on that Thank as you well. very much. Thank you. Um, it is said that it is not enough to preach the message. Mm. You have to be the message. Nice. And uh, Mr. Nice. Mr. Moyo, you are the message. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for having this conversation with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Pap. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you for tuning in.